It is good to be home. Uh, let me just say that. Uh, for those of you who... Uh, thank you. Thank you. For those of you who don't have a clue who I am because you started coming to Calvary in the last six weeks, let me introduce myself. I'm Chad Garrison. I'm the lead pastor here at Calvary. have been for 25 years, and uh, the, uh, the church was gracious enough to give me a, a six-week sabbatical uh, to celebrate that. And so uh, I've been gone for the last six weeks, so if you've been uh, new here in the last six weeks, welcome to Calvary, and, uh, and, and, and now you're going, do I really want to stay with him? Yeah. I, yeah, you got to figure that out now. Uh, but uh, let me just say something. There, there is no place like home, and I thank God for Calvary. Uh, I really do. A lot of you have asked the questions, yes, I'm rested, yes, I had a great time, but man, I am glad to be back, and, uh, and it is a joy to be worth <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, but, here, but here's the cool thing. While I was gone, uh, you know, God was working in our midst as a church uh, in just incredible ways. And whether you know this or not, let me just mention some of these. We sent two mission teams out, one to Albania. They've already come back. The other one's in uh, Hawaii right now, the big island Kona, working with the church plant, doing vacation Bible school and things like that, worshiping with uh, Kona Baptist Church this morning. And, uh, and that's amazing. We had about 140 kids come for Adventure for the City Camp uh, a couple weeks ago. Had a great time, a lot of decisions for Christ. But here's the coolest thing. While I was gone, uh, Calvary baptized over 50 believers in Christ. Isn't that awesome? See, God's power is just that. He doesn't need us. We need Him. He, he doesn't rely on us. We rely on him. And so I'm just celebrating what God has done and is doing and is going to do here at Calvary. And then I get back this week, and, and I'm you know, trying to get back uh, kind of in the routine of things. And uh, I get notified, and this is kind of cool, I get notified by Outreach Magazine that Calvary Lake Havasu in 2017 was one of the top 100 fastest growing churches in America. Is that cool or what? And, uh, I mean, people don't even understand how we live here, uh, and yet God is doing these incredible things uh, and, and changing lives in incredible ways, and I am thankful that he allows me to be part of the ministry of Calvary. And I'm thankful that uh, I get to come back and, and share with you today. Hey, we're continuing our Heroes series today, and I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, if, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of those in the seats around you and turn to page 283, 284, that's where we're going to be today uh, as a text. And by the way, if you need a Bible, you want to read Scripture and you don't have a Bible, then take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, hey, you know, pretty much everyone loves an underdog. You know, in the world of sports, everybody's rooting for the underdog, of course, unless you're a fan of the New England Patriots or Alabama Crimson Tide, uh, in which case you don't understand what underdog means. But, uh, but most people love underdogs. So what is your favorite sports underdog moment that has uh, occurred in your fandom? Uh, if you've got one, share it with the person sitting next to you. Ready, set, go. Favorite underdog moment in sports history. So there's not a lot of conversation going on. So if you're not a sports fan, I get that. But uh, my favorite sports underdog moment came in the 1983 NCAA basketball tournament, March Madness, uh, when the, the North Carolina State University Wolfpack took on the University of Houston Cougars. Now, here's the, here's the setup for this, this game because uh, it was supposed to be a mismatch. North Carolina State wasn't even supposed to be in the tournament. They qualified by winning their conference tournament miraculously. And then uh, in the tournament, they trailed in, in the nine games, conference tournament and NCAA tournament, they trailed in six of the nine games they played up until the last minute of the game. Uh, their, their roster had one guy who in the future would play in the NBA. He wasn't going to be a star or anything, but he was a player. The, the Houston Cougars team was littered with NBA players, including two future Hall of Famers. On paper, it was a mismatch. All of the news outlets, ESPN, it's a blowout. It's not going to, you know, there's no chance for North Carolina State. And, of course, they won the game 54-52 on a last-second miracle shot put back uh, by a guy that nobody remembers his name, Lorenzo Charles. And, and so uh, that's my favorite uh, 
underdog moment. It was the classic David versus Goliath game. Uh, so today, we're looking at the story that started the David and Goliath metaphor. The story of David and Goliath. That's right. Uh, and, and so what I want to do is let me just kind of recap the story, and then I want us to dive into it and look at some of the details. So if you're familiar with this story, or if you're not, here's the setup in 1 Samuel 17. I encourage you to read this at home later on. Uh, the Israelites and the Philistines were enemies, and so they went to war against each other. And the way they did that was they lined up on opposite sides of a valley, uh, and they both had the high ground, and they waited for the other one to attack. And, of course, neither one wants to attack uphill. And, and so what ended up happening is the Philistine champion, a guy named Goliath, who was huge. Okay, Now, depending on how you translate the biblical measurements, he was somewhere between 6 foot 6 and 9 foot 6. Okay, aren't exactly sure, but if you understand that the average male of uh, 3,000 years ago was about 5 foot 3 inches tall, Goliath was huge, no matter how you measure him. So he was head and shoulders above everybody else, and, uh, and he came out on the lines, decked out in his armor, his, you know, his helm, and, and his shield, and his swords, and his spears, and everything. And he came out every morning for 40 days, and he would issue this challenge. Hey, send out your champion from the Israelite army, and let him face me, mano a mano, man on man, and the winner takes all. The winner rules the losers. And for 40 days, he'd issue this challenge, and not one person from the Israelite army accepted the challenge. In fact, Scripture says they all wanted to run and hide in fear. Until the day this kid named David shows up. David is not in the army. David is not a warrior. He is not a soldier. David is a shepherd for his dad. I should say for his daddy, because he was the youngest of seven boys. And he was probably a late teenager, maybe early 20s, but probably late teens. And he showed up at the, at the battle line simply to deliver supplies. His dad said, hey, take this bread, take this grain, take this stuff up to your brothers. See how they're doing. Bring back a report about how your brother's doing. Because three of David's brothers were in the army. And so David goes up with the supplies. And he gets there about the time Goliath is taunting the Israelites and insulting their God. And, and, uh, and, and so David goes, hey, who, isn't anybody going to go out there and fight him? And they go, no, man, we're not going to go out there and fight him. But if anyone went out there and fought him and he won, then he would get to marry the king's daughter and get all kinds of riches. And David's like, count me in, I'll fight him. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, if, if you know how the story goes, then David went out there and, and he killed Goliath. And the, the Israelites routed the Philistines and David became the hero of the story, David and Goliath. Now, th this is the, the, the greatest upset in history. David defeating Goliath. And the story is so powerful, it still resonates in our culture. And even among people who have no idea it's a Bible story, they use this metaphor, this analogy, all the time. So what can we learn from David? Uh, what does this incredible and familiar account teach us about being heroes of faith? Uh, first thing is this. Giants are part of life. Giants are part of life. Goliath was the opposition. He was the threat. He was, his presence caused fear and anxiety and the urge to run. And everyone in this room has giants in their lives. You have obstacles to success, challenges to your well-being, situations and issues that create fear and make us want to run away. Now, I know we don't call them giants we call them tragedies, crisis, you know, problems. We call them addictions or bills or deadlines or projects. Sometimes we call them illnesses or handicaps. Occasionally we call them people, you know, relationships that we have. Maybe it's an ex, maybe it's the in-laws, maybe it's the boss. But we all have these giants in our lives. And, and by the way, when I say we all have giants, it means everyone has giants. You may be facing obstacles and problems in your life that you think nobody else has to face. But the reality is every person in this room, the people sitting next to you down the road, that you don't have a clue about their life, they're facing giants too. Every one of us has giants in our life, battles that we are facing and fighting. And, and, and they're different than ours. The people around you are different. But they're real. And nothing feels quite as exhilarating as defeating a giant. 
When we defeat a giant, when we overcome a problem like this, it is noteworthy and cause for celebration. But, but just know this. If you defeat a giant, there are always more giants. It is not a one and done kind of thing. You don't have a giant in your life. You have giants in your life. How do I know that? Because uh, Goliath had relatives. <laughs> See, a lot of times we think David killed Goliath and all the problems are gone. No, they continued to fight the Philistines for years. And Scripture recounts at least four more relatives of the giant. We don't know if they were sons or brothers or uncles or what, but, but he was not the only one. You see, giants are part of life, and they're a repetitive part of life. And so how are we going to overcome these, these giants? You know, because we want to win the battle. We want to be the hero of our own story, don't we? I mean, I don't know anybody who goes, hey, I want to be the loser in my story. I want to be the, the one who, you know, we want to be the heroes. So how do we do this? What can we learn from our hero, David? So let's look at some heroic traits. You know, I look at David's actions in the story, and I can identif identify four traits in him that, that I want us to use to evaluate our lives and see how we can become more heroic. See how we can step into that place of being the giant killer, the one who overcomes the adversity, the one who succeeds when others fail. How do we become that, that hero of the faith? All right, four traits. First of all, David knew himself. David knew his strengths and his weaknesses. Uh, I want us to look at pieces of the story. So we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit. Verses 38 through 40. 38 through 40. Now David has already volunteered to fight Goliath, and he's having a conversation with the king, Saul. And so here's how it goes. Then Saul, the king, clothed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of bronze on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped on Saul's sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off, and then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. David knew himself. He didn't try to wear King Saul's armor and use his weapon. Now, uh, understand that at this day and time, they didn't, you know, outfit the people in the army with all the same equipment. Uh, every man kind of showed up with his own stuff, and Saul was the king of Israel, so he had the best armor in the country and the best weapon in the country, and, and, uh, and he said, David, you're going to go fight the, the giant here. Put on my armor. It's the best armor. Problem was, it didn't fit David. Saul was also the tallest person in Israel, and David was a kid, you know, a teenager. And so they put the armor on David, and he's like, I can't do this. I can't even move. And, and David realized that, and he realized, hey, I don't want to be a warrior in the mold of somebody else's idea of what a warrior is. He was true to himself. He didn't try to be somebody else. He didn't try to imitate somebody else. David decided that he was going to be who he was, and he accepted that, and he was successful at it. Maybe that's why David wrote Psalm 139. And by the way, I'd encourage you, write down Psalm 139. Go home sometime this week and read that. Uh, it's a beautiful psalm. And in the midst of it, David says this, I praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows that full well. I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David says, look, I know who I am, and I praise God for him making me. You see, God made you. God created you to be you. He didn't create you to be somebody else. He created you to be you. And, and, and he loves you, and he's gifted you, and, and he's made you wonderfully. And guess what? He created you to defeat giants. Think about that. He created you to win the battles, to be a hero. So are you okay with you? Are you okay with you? How God made you? Who God made you to be? Can you acknowledge your flaws, your weaknesses, your failures? Are you okay with you? Can you identify your, your strengths, your giftedness, that you, your influence on others that God has, has given you? You see, I know some people, they're great at identifying their flaws. 
They can spend all day telling you about their flaws and their weaknesses and their failures, but they struggle to identify one single good thing about themselves. They struggle really to honestly praise God and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. On the other hand, I've met some people who can't identify any of their flaws and they think they're God's gift to this world. Look, both people have issues there. Can you see both your flaws and your strengths? You see, heroes know themselves and they're honest about themselves and who God made them to be. So first of all, David knew himself. Heroes know themselves. And secondly, David leaned on real life skills and experiences. Look at uh, verses 33 through 37. Uh, again, David has just volunteered, and King Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, All right, then go and God be with you. Look, David was not a soldier, but he was not a novice either. And for the record, David was not harmless. David had fought and killed lions and bears. That's a pretty impressive job skill that translates to being a warrior. I don't know if you guys think about that, but, but it is. And for the record, David went into battle armed and lethal. Um, I don't know how many of you grew up going to Sunday school or vacation Bible school and hearing the stories about David uh, and Goliath and everything, but they, th those stories kind of misrepresented that a little bit, at least the ones that I was taught, because a lot of times I was kind of taught that David was like 12 years old and he went into battle kind of with a toy. That was not the case. He was a little bit older than that. He was a young man, but uh, he went into battle armed and lethal. The sling that David had was not a toy. In fact, it was used by ancient armies all the way up until the Middle Ages. And at the time of David, slings were far more effective than bows and arrows. They had a greater range and they were more lethal. The, the smooth stones, let's talk about that. These were not pebbles that he picked out of his stream, like, oh, how cute. No, the stones that they used for slings were between the size of a golf ball and a baseball. Think about that. Would you allow me to pick up a stone like that, stand about 20 feet away from you and throw it at your head? And I have a weak arm, and you still wouldn't let me do that. Because it would do damage. And, and David isn't throwing it with his arm. David is slinging it out of a sling at velocity, and he's practiced at this because he tells us, hey, I've already encountered bears and lions. Now think about this. He's done this with a staff and a sling kid is not messing around. I mean, some of you might go, hey, I'll take on a bear or a lion if I've got a high-powered rifle and a scope and distance. And he hasn't done, he didn't have any of those things, and he still took it on. I mean, he was incredibly qualified to defend himself. So he went into battle prepared, not the enemy's way, but his way. But he was prepared for battle. In other words, heroes are prepared for battle. Here's the reality. God has been preparing you to be a hero your entire life. All of your experiences, all of your victories and your defeats have given you wisdom and understanding for the battle. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then, then uh, you are in a battle. Scripture says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Satan is opposing us. We're facing giants that are real, and God has prepared you to face that battle. So if Jesus has changed your life, then you have an incredible story of life change that God can use to make a difference in this world and for you to win the battles for you to defeat the giants, for you to overcome. He has prepared you. Your skills and your abilities, whether natural or acquired, have prepared you to be useful for God's kingdom. 
Now, most of us, though, would argue that we're prepared. Most of us would protest and say, yes, but, but I, I'm not ready yet. I need to read the Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to learn more about God and, and, and his kingdom and the church and all this kind of stuff. Okay, look, I'll agree with you in part. All of us need to read the Bible more. All of us need to pray more. All of us need to learn more. But here's the reality. God wants to use you right now to be his hero. And he's prepared you for that. And some of you have all kinds of experience and, and wisdom that you've acquired through the battles of life, the scars that you've earned, and God really wants to use those to build up his kingdom in ways that maybe you've never thought about. But you have skills and abilities that translate into his kingdom's work, whether you realize that or not. So heroes know themselves. Heroes are prepared. And then thirdly, David trusted God's power instead of people's expectations. David trusted in God's power, not people's expectations. Look at verses 45 through 47. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Do you know what that is? That is both a beautiful declaration of faith in God and prophetic trash talking. I mean, that's what, he's, that's what he's doing. I mean, Goliath has already insulted David, made fun of him being a boy, made fun of him not having armor and swords and stuff, and, and, and insulted the God of David. And David just goes, you don't get it. God is going to defeat you. He's going to use me to do it. And uh, David trusted God. He, he was prepared for battle. He knew himself. But ultimately, he trusted God's power. Now, everybody around David expected him to fail. Um, you read the account, David's brothers did not think highly of him, and they didn't expect that he was going to succeed. The, the soldiers on the Israelite side who'd been afraid and, and hiding for 40 days didn't think this kid's going to succeed. King Saul, I, I don't believe, thought that David was going to succeed. You know, I think he was already working on his excuses so that when Goliath killed David, he'd go, hey, he's really not part of my army. He's not even a soldier here. Just some idiot kid who showed up. I let him go out there and, and just to entertain. You know, I, I'm sure he was going to you know, renege on the deal and say, ah, we're not serving you just because you beat a kid. And, and I say that because Saul didn't know who David was. He met David. He gave him his armor. David gave it back. He knew David's name. But after David killed Goliath, you know what he asked? Whose boy is that? What family is he from? He didn't have a clue. He's like, holy cow, i got to figure out who this guy is. i got to reward him now. Goliath expected David to fail. He mocked him, made fun of him. He was insulted that David came out to fight him. Nobody expected David to succeed, but David didn't listen to them. He trusted in God's power, not people's negative perspectives. If you and I want to be heroes, we have to focus on God's power, not the naysayers around us. If you're going to be a hero, you've got to focus on God and what he can do, not what people tell you God can't do in your life and through your life. Um, honestly, I've been told numerous times what God can't do at Calvary. Uh, in 1993, uh, I, I was told we can't have three good financial years in a row and uh, by the chairman of stewardship who was resigning because he didn't want to oversee a sinking ship. And we just finished 25 years of God providing enough resources. You know, uh, yeah. In, in, in 1998, we were in the process of building the sanctuary over on McCulloch that we worshiped in for about 16 years. And, uh, and, and somebody told me, you'll never finish this building. We were building it with volunteers. And they said, oh, you'll never get it done. It's just going to be a monument to failure. I guess they were wrong. 2003, had uh, one of our leaders in the church leave the church when we bought the property here at Sweetwater. Uh, and his reasoning was, you'll never pay that off, much less build on the property. Really? And then in uh, 2009, we're getting ready to start our Saturday night service. And I had lots of people tell me, you know, a Saturday night service isn't going to work. You know, it's not going to work. Last night, 
5 o'clock. It's 122 degrees when I pull into the, the, the dirt behind the building. And we had over 300 people worshiping God here in the dead of summer. Yeah. See, those are just a, a few of the times that people say it's not going to work. God can't do that. You're going to fail. And, and they never say things like God can't do that. They just tell you what, uh, what you're doing that God's leading you to do isn't going to work. And, and so here's what I realize is going on in our lives. You've got people around you that Satan is using to speak negativity into your life, to try and tell you you're going to fail, you can't do it, God can't redeem, you can't overcome, all that kind of stuff. And, and what I'm here to tell you is, are you listening to them? Are you trusting in God's power? That, that God really can restore and heal your marriage. That God really can redeem your failures. It doesn't matter how you've messed up. God can redeem that and then turn around and use you to heal other people. That God really can use you to make a difference in his kingdom, in the lives of other people. That God really can set you free from your addiction or your habit. All right, we've got a ministry on Monday nights full of people who celebrate the fact that God sets them free. If you're, if you're struggling with that, you've got to check it out. And, and, and you've got to, you know, there are people all the time who are telling you, you know what, you'll, you'll never really lead your family or your friends to faith in Jesus Christ. And here's the reality. You can listen to them and give up, or you can listen to God and be a hero. But you can't do both. And David was trusting in God. He's like, I don't care what you guys say. I know what God can do. And so my question this morning is, are you focusing on the power of God? Or are you listening to all the excuses to why you can't succeed? Because God's power is enough. If he can take a shepherd boy and use him to kill the champion of another army, then he can certainly give you the power to overcome the obstacles that you're facing. Heroes trust in God's power. And then the fourth thing we see in David's life that is a, a heroic trait is that David acted in faith. Continue the story, verse 48. It says, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Now then David ran over to, to Goliath where he had fallen. He took Goliath's sword, cut Goliath's head off, and then the Israelites defeated the Philistines because the Philistines all got freaked out. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing. David acted in faith. Now he volunteered, he declared victory, and then he went into battle and actually won the victory. David acted in faith. You know what I've come to realize? Passive people never kill giants. Spectators never defeat giants. Critics are ineffective against giants. Heroes defeat giants. Heroes defeat giants. And notice this. David volunteered. He didn't wait to be asked. David volunteered. Nobody's going to fight the giant? I'll fight the giant. I'll, I'll do it. And, and here's the thing, if David hadn't volunteered, no one would have ever asked David to go fight Goliath. I mean, heck, he was a delivery boy, a shepherd. He wasn't a warrior. He wasn't trained. He wasn't equipped. He didn't have all the stuff that, that they thought he needed to have. Nobody would have ever asked David to go and be the hero. David didn't let that get in the way. He volunteered to go into battle. See, I believe that we have hundreds of potential heroes in this room right now, and some of you are waiting to be asked. Some of you are waiting to be asked. Some of you are waiting for a sign from God. Some of you are waiting for, you know, more time to magically appear on your calendar. Some of you are waiting for, I don't know, you fill in the excuse. And there are spiritual battles to be fought. There are giant obstacles in your life and in this community. And God has created you to be a hero. God has prepared you for the battle. Do you trust God's power? Will you act in faith? Because I'll just be honest with you, we need heroes. 
We need heroes. There are 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. So don't think just because Outreach Magazine said, hey, Calvary, you're being successful, that we can check the box and say, mission accomplished. No. Our mission field is your friends, your neighbors, your family that, that don't know God and need this life-changing relationship with Jesus. They need to have their sins forgiven. They need to know that their destiny is heaven because of Jesus Christ and his love for them. We need heroes who are going to be part of that, that mission of outreach, of caring for this community, of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We need heroes who, who are going to step up and say, hey, I want to serve. I want to be a part of this ministry. I want to help make things happen. We need heroes who are willing to say, I want to lead. There are some of you that God has equipped through years in, in the business world, and you've got some, some talents and abilities and experience that, that we could use in tremendous ways. There's some of you that, that love people and, and love seeing life change happen in people that we need to be life group leaders. We need heroes. We need heroes in the early childhood wing. You know, uh, just, to, just to love kids. Let me tell you something really cool. You know, last year, uh, Calvary as a church grew 28% year over year uh, uh, from the time we got into Sweetwater. That was really cool, but our kids' ministry grew by 32%. That means that God keeps sending us more and more kids, which means that we need more and more people who love children to, to go and volunteer for, you know, one weekend a month or one service a month to, to help out. And, and, and a lot of you are in this room that love children. I mean, and, and children love you. There are some of you in this room that really don't like kids. Uh, if you're going to volunteer in the children's ministry, it needs to be for, like, security, okay? Because grumpy people can do security. We're, we're okay with that. But, but see, here's the thing. There's a lot of you that just, you love kids, and, and some of you are like, yeah, my grandkids don't live close, and I wish I could see them more. Hey, there's a whole wing full of grandkids waiting to be loved. And, 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 I'm, and I'm being serious about that. I mean, how hard is it to say, hey, you know what, once a month, I'll come at 930, and I'll work at 11. I'll volunteer. I'll, I'll go in there. And yeah, you have to go through, you know, signing up, and you have to go through an interview, and we've got to do background checks and stuff like that because we're going to protect our kids above everything else. But, but you know, hey, we need heroes. We need heroes that, that uh, want to help us out with Thunderbolt. You know, we volunteered to, to paint Thunderbolt. I don't know what kind of idiot said, hey, we'll paint all 40 rooms. Oh, wait, that was me. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But you know, you're going like, I don't have any like, these spiritual gifts, but I can tape like a madman, then we need you. We, we need some people who love to put paint on walls and make it look good, not just, you know, make messes. And, and, and so we need heroes. You know, go online and volunteer, sign up. Say, here I am. Don't wait to be asked. See, if we're going to really impact this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it can't be a few heroes. We need, we need hundreds of heroes. And God created you to be a hero. The question is, are we going to step up to the task? Uh, it was really cool this week because I caught a hero in action. I didn't really catch him. I just kind of really observed it. Um, uh, here's, here's the story. Uh, I was at Smith's getting uh, fuel for my car, and uh, like everybody else, got the pump going, and uh, then I was starting to zone out on my phone, and, and I heard a conversation that was happening on the other side of the pump. Uh, yes, I eavesdropped, okay? I admit that. But the conversation was between two ladies, and, um, and they were catching up. They hadn't seen each other in a while. And one of them, obviously, or seemingly, had been through some difficulties and some struggles. And, and uh, so her friend said, hey, you should go to church with me. Now I started eavesdropping on purpose, okay? And I'm like, oh, good job. I wonder who this, who this person is. And I couldn't see him because the pump was in the way. And, uh, and the person said, well, what church do you go to? And she said, well, I go to that new big one out on the highway, Calvary. And at that point, you know, my heart was leaping inside, and I wanted to jump around the pump and go, and I'm the pastor! Uh, but I didn't want to freak her out. So uh, I didn't. I just was re just rejoicing in what God was doing. And still, I couldn't see the person who was inviting them. So if you're here today, uh, come and introduce yourself, because I want to say, good job. Uh, but, uh, uh, but here they were, just simply being a hero in that moment to a friend who they knew needed God. And they knew that they can't heal that person's heart. They can't make everything well. But they knew they could introduce them to the person who can, Jesus. Guys, we need heroes. God's created you to be a hero. He's called you to be a hero. He's prepared you for the battle. Are you going to trust his power in your life? And are you going to make that decision to act in faith? Because the time for heroes is now.
The giants are everywhere, not just in your life, but in this community. So will you be a hero? Will you be a hero this week? Real time. Not someday, but today. Let's pray.